Hello, everybody. We're going to give everyone just one more minute to join, and then we will get started. So get comfortable. If you want to run and grab some extra coffee or water, feel free. And uh, we'll get started here in about one minute. Okay, I can see people are joining. That's great. I will give a bit of a preamble as people still pile in. Um, welcome. Welcome to South Pole's first webinar of 2024. Um, we intend for this to be a series throughout the year. Um, so if you find today useful, we would love to see you back next month. Today, we are going to be unpacking California's recently enacted climate disclosure laws. Um, which I know are on a lot of businesses' minds right now. Um, before we jump in, a couple pieces of housekeeping. Uh, next slide. So as you join, you will notice that you are muted. Um, but if you do have questions, there is a question um, function. So please enter those questions, and we will save lots of time for questions and discussions at the end. Um, also, if you have colleagues that were wishing to attend today but couldn't, we will record this session um, and send it out to everyone so that you can pass it around. Um, a few very quick words on who we are at South Pole, uh, in case you are not familiar. So South Pole is a global environmental consultancy firm as well as a carbon asset developer. Uh, we have been around for 16 years, headquartered in Zurich. Uh, with our North American headquarters in New York City. We have over a thousand employees and over 30 offices. We have a large global presence. And we are very lucky to work with some renowned partners, some Fortune 500 and very climate ambitious companies. What do we work with those companies on is several different topics. Next slide. A couple of them that I thought I would highlight today that are pertinent to today's discussion are obviously greenhouse gas accounting. We love large, messy, scope three challenges, um, as well as climate risk assessments, looking at not only your assets, the physical assets, but the transitional risks that are posing to your business, as well as you know supply chain disruption and the like. Biodiversity and water are also hot topics that we've been discussing quite frequently with companies. Um, net zero, not only setting the targets, but the roadmaps to get there as well is another topic we often deal with. Renewable pathways from EACs to PPAs, um, and agricultural roadmaps. We go right down to the farm level of interventions, flag emissions, and the like. So my name is Chris Heisel. I'm the Director of Climate Strategies here in North America. And I am here today with my esteemed colleagues, Irvi and Harmon, and I will pass it over to them for their introductions. And I will see you back at the question period. So Irvi, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Looking forward to diving deep into these regulations today. My name is Irvi. I'm a Senior Managing Consultant. And in my role at South Pole, I help clients measure their greenhouse gas emissions. Once they have an inventory, I help them turn that conversation into strategy, meaning how do we set meaningful targets and reduction strategies. So today I'll be providing an overview of SB 253 and an overview of key challenges and considerations for the GHG accounting process. Armin, over to you. Thanks, Ermi. Pleasure to be here and thanks for everyone who's joined. Uh, my name is Harmon. I'm a senior managing consultant here at South Pole. I'm the practice lead in North America for climate risks and opportunities. I'll be covering 261 today. And in my role at South Pole, you know, work with end-to-end -end solutions on climate risks and opportunities. And that's everything from understanding disclosure requirements, developing stakeholder engagement plans, quantifying and understanding what those impacts are, all the way through to developing mitigation and adaptation strategies to make your business more, more resilient. And we'll get into some of that today as it relates to uh, California disclosures. Pass it back to you, Irby. 
go to the next slide. Great, so today we're gonna to provide a brief introduction of the three bills. We'll also walk through a deep dive between um, 253 and 261. We'll provide an overview of the different uh, differences between the disclosures, wrap it up with key takeaways, and then plenty of time, as Chris mentioned, for the questions and answers. But just before we get started, a quick disclaimer that the information today is for general informational purposes only. It's not intended to be any legal advice, please contact your advisors for further information related to any assurances or interpretation for your organization. So with that, let's start with a brief introduction of the bills in a nutshell. To the next slide. Perfect. So to start out with SB 253, this bill requires companies that do business in California to report on their scope one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions. SB 261 requires companies to issue a climate related financial risk report. And then finally, Assembly Bill 1305 requires companies to make claims um, such as climate neutrality or net zero to disclose and support the accuracy of such claims. Today's webinar is going to focus on the first two bills in particular. So as we're moving from a voluntary disclosure environment to a regulated one, these bills are part of a global movement as a whole, including requirements for the SEC's proposed climate disclosure rule in the US, and then the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, or CSRD, in the EU. So in a few slides, Harman's going to go over the differences between these regulatory requirements. And just to clarify before we get into the deep dives, what it actually means to do business in California is still a little unclear in the legislative text. However, the California Corporations Code and tax laws under the California Revenue and Taxation Code further provides clarification on what it means to do business in California. So the three primary definitions for this right now, one, if a company engages in any transaction for the purpose or financial gain in California, Two, if the company is organized or has commercial residence in California. And then three, if the company has sales, property, or payroll exceeding specified amounts in California. So again, it's still unclear whether these bills will use this definition or if it will use revenue from financial reporting, tax revenue, or some other definition. And ultimately, the California Air Resources Board, known as CARB, will be responsible for adopting these regulations. And CARB, like many aspects within the bill, are expected to provide further details in the upcoming year as well. So with that, let's start with an overview of SB 253. Great. So SB 253, the Climate Corporate Data Accountability Act, that's a handful. But in a nutshell, this bill requires large public and private companies doing business in California to disclose their scope one, two, and three greenhouse gas emissions. So the revenue threshold for this includes companies that has a total annual revenue greater than 1 billion US dollars that does business in California. This also means that if a parent company is located outside of California, but has operations in California, the entire parent company is subject to these reporting requirements based on the existing standards in the bill. This also means that companies will be required to report emissions for their entire organization, even emissions that are generated outside of California. When we're looking at the actual reporting requirements, just a quick refresher on scope one, two, and three GHG emissions. So scope one emissions are those that result directly from a company's activities. Scope two are indirect emissions from the consumption of purchased electricity, steam, heating, and cooling. And scope three is everything else. So all indirect emissions produced from the company's value chain, both upstream and downstream of the value chain. I think scope three emissions are the juicy part of this regulation. Scope three can be very intimidating. There's a lot of complexities there, especially for organizations with complex value chains. And in a couple of slides, I'll walk you through an overview of how to best prepare for this and some key considerations to keep in mind. Now, the great thing here is that the reporting requirements are in accordance with the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. So the Greenhouse Gas Protocol is the internationally recognized standard for which most corporations conduct their greenhouse gas accounting. 
And like I said, the good news is, is that when we're looking at other regulations like CSRD or the proposed SEC rule, they're also both aligned with the greenhouse gas protocol. And again, Harman will do a bit of a deeper dive in that. But when we look at the timeline slide here, we mentioned 2024 as a critical year to help prepare for this reporting. There are many elements of this, especially if companies that have not done their GHG accounting before, that they need to plan and prepare for. The first reporting requirement is in 2026, where scope one and two disclosures required from fiscal year 2025 data. There's limited assurance required in 2026 as well. When we look into scope three, 2027 is that critical year where scope three accounting will be required 180 day, no later than 180 days after scope one and two reporting. So the intent of staggering these deadlines was really so that companies can collect scope one and two emissions from their suppliers and their value chain that can then be used in the scope three calculations of the reporting organization. And again, CARB may update the scope three emissions deadline based on trends. There's going to be considerable stakeholder input to see how well received this is and what makes practical sense in actually implementing these changes. By 2030, we're looking at reasonable assurance on scope one and two emissions and limited assurance for the scope three GHG accounting. Again, subject to change based on how that reporting timeline goes. The reporting is going to be required on an annual basis, and the reporting will be submitted through a publicly accessible digital platform for the emissions data that's going to also be developed by CARB. When it comes to penalties, there is a penalty of up to $500,000 per reporting year. However, it's also important to note that Scope 3 has a safeguard from penalties, that is if the company has done this Scope 3 accounting with reasonable basis, and provided in good faith, recognizing the complexities that can exist there. So if we move to the next slide, now that we have this information, what do we do with it? How do we apply it? And where do we go from here? So I want to walk you through a couple of our learnings working with companies from all different sizes and complexities and what to expect during the greenhouse gas accounting process. So the first step, defining boundaries. So we recommend spending as much time upfront as possible to map out and organize some of the key elements required for success. This means reviewing your organizational and operational structure, determining what's actually in scope as per the greenhouse gas protocol. And once you're really clear about what will be in scope, it'll be easier to determine where that data can come from within your organization. And that takes us to the second point of stakeholder engagement. The three biggest challenges in greenhouse gas accounting can come from data availability, data aggregation, and lack of stakeholder engagement. So to start off in terms of data availability, especially for scope three GHG accounting, this can send you in a bit of a rabbit hole, right? And while we wanna focus on more granular data, which will allow better insights into key opportunities for reductions, sometimes it's important to consider what type of data is actually available within your organization and the level of effort required to get that data. So it's a true balancing act to drive decision-making. Now, the second challenge of data aggregation. So depending on the organization and how complex it is, data might come from various parts of the business. So depending on how siloed the organization is, how easy it is to receive data, there could be double counting of information or even gaps in information to help comply with the requirements. And that kind of takes us into the Third challenge of stake, lack of stakeholder engagement. We know the data is coming from various parts of the business and making sure that you have the key stakeholders engaged and brought along the journey is very helpful to get to the finish line, especially because chances are they're collecting this data on top of their day job. So once you have the data and we work towards data collection, this is where different gaps can be evaluated, reach out to suppliers, determine where it makes sense to fill in those gaps. We do the calculations, you have all the data, and this is where the data is processed. You're looking at assumptions, proxies, any decisions that might need to be made, which emission factors, which databases are most applicable, and ensuring that your inventory is reviewed and robust to the best of your abilities. When you have your final inventory, highly recommend mapping out all of these decisions in something what we call an inventory management plan. 
So this is where we'll document where the data came from within your organization, any assumptions, methodologies, and this will really help streamline it, not just for the future assurance uh, requirements in future years, but making the process a lot easier in subsequent years and working towards better data granularity. So this is a mouthful. All of this can be daunting. And we always recommend aiming for progress over perfection, especially in the first year of greenhouse gas accounting. And all to say, again, starting in 2024 is the recommended approach so you can map out what the efforts will look like for your organization. And now, before we jump into details of SB 261, Elizabeth is going to launch a poll. So please refer to the screen here. And we love to know where you're at in terms of measuring scope three emissions as an organization. I'll give about 35, 40 seconds to answer the poll. It looks like it's fairly even across the board. Many companies that have not started measuring, it's starting to talk about it, partially done it, again, partially because of the level of effort required. And then those companies that have already measured their scope three emissions, they're well on set and meeting the requirements. So thanks for taking the time for that. And with that, I'll pass the mic to Harmon to go over 261. Thank you, Ari. Just give it a second for the screen to pop up. Thanks. Um, so uh, I'll provide an overview of SB 261, which is focusing on climate related financial risk. It's considered the younger sibling of 253, but not to be underestimated. In terms of companies in scope, uh, similar to 253, it applies to public and private entities doing business in California. However, key note here, the threshold for revenues is lower. It's uh, the threshold for 261 is five, uh, 500 million instead of that billion, which understandably implicates more uh, global organizations. Um, and it's worth noting, you know, California is the fifth biggest economy, soon to be the fourth. So you know, approximately 10,000 organizations uh, are implicated by this bill and about 5,000 for 253. Now the reporting requirements, although rather brief, are quite complex, rather brief in the bill, they're quite complex and, and impactful. The first clear requirement is reporting on climate related financial risks resulting in financial impact either in the short or long term due to physical and transition risks. And we'll unpack that in the next slide, what we mean by that. And then second is measures adopted to reduce and adapt to those risks. To put it in simple terms, what are your most material risks and what are you going to do about it? Now, where that bill is rather brief in detail, it relies on TCFD framework to kind of fill in the blanks. And for those who are unfamiliar, the TCFD framework is the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures. It's the gold standard for understanding climate risks, opportunities, and mitigation measures, and more broadly, climate strategy in your journey. And this consists of four key principles, uh, pillars. Governance, so disclosing and understanding how your organization's board and management will oversee climate risks. Strategy, disclosing those climate risks or the impact of that under different time horizons, typically short, medium, and long term, and then under a number of different scenarios, notably one that aligns with a, a below two degrees warming world. The third pillar is risk management, disclosing how you're going about identifying those risks, assessing them, and managing them. And this can, you know, akin to some of the core business functions that are in, in your organization, such as ERM um, and compliance, like, uh, as an example. And then the last pillar is metrics and targets, understanding what, what your, your targets are and how are you progressing towards those. 
as it relates to climate risks and opportunities. So in the next slide, we'll just look at the timelines uh, outlined in, in 261. What you'll notice right off the bat is there's less timelines on this bill compared to 253. And that's for the reason, you know, the key date in the bill is 2026. But just to take a step back, you know, at South Pole, we're encouraging 2024 as also a key date because understanding and preparing for those requirements should be thought of as a concrete milestone in your disclosure journey. Now coming to 2026, this is the date that's indicated in the bill. And that's where the requirement is to publish your, your financial risks as well as your reduction measures. So both parts of that bill. And then just to highlight, you know, the, the other kind of direction from that bill is this should happen by biannually, so every two years. So as an example, your next milestone would be 2028. And the idea is this is meant to be an iterative and evolving process that your organization starts to understand the risks more and more, and understandably, they will, they will evolve as your business evolves. To note, the disclosure, unlike 253, um, you know, organizations can publish that on their website. So a little bit less of a hurdle. Um, and the idea there is to borrow from existing practice practices that many organizations already you know, have in place following the TCFD framework, for instance. And the penalty, although slightly lower, it's still worth noting is 50,000 per reporting year. Um, many of you, you know, who have sustainability budgets may appreciate that's not a small amount. Now, in the next slide, I'd like to take a minute to kind of unpack what the process looks like when we talk about quantifying financial risks. It's not for the faint hearted. So what we have outlined on this page is the approach we take with clients starting at the very start of the journey, all the way through to getting them disclosure ready and becoming more resilient. And this framework aligns with the TCFD and now ISSB framework for, of steps outlined to get to that financially material um, kind of outcome of risks across your business. Now, when we talk about risk, there's, there's two, two buckets of risks we look at. Physical, which pertains to risks associated with a higher warming planet. So when we think about four degrees or beyond. And those typically manifest in impacts to your supply chain and your physical assets, such as extreme weather events, such as flooding, or chronic changes like extreme temperature rise or sea level. Now, on the other side, we look at transition risks and opportunities, and this is the other side of the equation. So as we move towards a rapid transition and decarbonizing, staying below that two degrees um, global temperature, there are risks associated with that as we, as we approach that. And those can be policy, legal, market, energy costs, reputation, customer backlash, the like. Now, those are the, uh, that's the spread of risks that we consider. And then outlined here are four key phases or steps that are required to funnel down to that eventual financial materiality, starting with identifying and mapping the risks across your value chain. And this is what we typically think of as a risk register or your long list to understand exactly where you're potentially exposed. And we kind of view this as a collective exercise, engaging as many stakeholders or you know, subject matter experts within your organization as possible. The next key step is we start to prioritize building on the knowledge and expertise of your organization, working with stakeholders to understand what those which risks are potentially material and where you are potentially vulnerable. And then we start to getting into kind of assessing those risks. And that's where you look at a qualitative scenario analysis under multiple time horizons and, 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 and scenarios to further narrow down that list into into a ranking, a relative ranking. And then from there, we start to quantify to try to understand those potentially material risks by understanding what the key business inputs are, adding the climate data and, and, and science to it to really try to quantify what that, that financial impact could be. And that's how you land at what the key ask of the disclosure is. You know, to punctuate that, although again, it's brief, the ask, this is a multi-year and a multi-step journey that typically involves 
key members of your organization, including finance, strategy, risk management, and then the operations. So before we go to the next sec section, I'll pause here to get a pulse check of, you know, where are you at in your journey of understanding financial impacts related to climate risks? Have you not started? Have you taken the first step of identifying those climate risks? Have you performed, you know, a screening or a qualitative scenario analysis on those risks? And then lastly, have you started to look at quantifying those risks and understanding impacts? So we'll give it again another minute. It's great to see that a lot of organizations and teams have started to under, understand and identify those climate risks, but it's not surprising that, you know, there's still just a few of you that have started to understand the, the financial impacts. And this is what we see with clients who come to us to try to, you know, move them along in their journey. So in the next section, I'll just provide a quick overview of how the two, dis the two uh, bills compare to disclosures that you may be more familiar with. So we'll just give it a second to switch the screen here. Great, thank you. It's a busy slide, but we'll kind of highlight some key takeaways. So the, the California climate bills were not developed in isolation. And this is, you know, they may have caught some teams and organizations off guard, but they really borrow and they're inspired from existing frameworks and disclosures. So we'll outline kind of some of the key, you know, unique qualities, as well as some of the different, uh, as, as well as some of the aspects which overlap with these bills. So as we know, SB 253 and 261 have been signed into law. The SEC is still pending. However, you know, the projection is that that will be signed into law in the first part of this year. The CSRD is in effect in Europe. And, and for those organizations and teams working in Europe are quite familiar with the implications of that because that has a much broader scope of regulations. Um, so the criteria, the threshold, now California is unique in the sense that it applies to private organizations as well. And this is where a lot of organizations were caught off guard. And as the fifth biggest economy or the fourth soon to be, it implicates a lot of organizations. The SEC, you know, as we're familiar, it, it's for public registrants uh, in the US. And then the CSRD is also far reaching, it's, it's for organizations doing business in Europe. Um, location of reporting, We've kind of hammered out, um, but notably, you know, for especially for 261, there is flexibility to just borrow from your existing reporting for other frameworks. Now, for reporting requirements, I won't go over it too much, but on the GHG front, you know, California goes beyond uh, maybe where even SEC will land on scope three emissions. And that's, as, as, as Urvi walked us through, that's the trickiest part of it. And on financial impact, risk and impact, both SCC and CSRD borrow from the TCFD and ISSB frameworks. So there's overlap there. And then just to emphasize the backbone of these two disclosures is really those global frameworks and standards that have been in the works for a number of years, um, such as TCFD, which has now been absorbed by the ISSB and things such as the GHG protocol. Said another way, if you're aligning yourself to those key frameworks, your majority of the weight there key differences here are the timelines, but the takeaway as we'll get into the next section is to start today. Because a lot of these frameworks build on the same key requirements and are inspired by the same objectives. 
um, and demands of, of organizations. With that, I'll pass it over to Urvi. I'm not sure if we have a poll here, but if not, I'll pass it over to Urvi to kind of bring it home. Slide. Great. So to summarize, climate-related reporting is now becoming mandatory. It's no longer a nice to do or nice to have, but it's going to be mandated by law. And we're seeing this as a global movement. So even if the proposed SCC regulation does not come into effect, there are some nuances with this California regulation, which can impact companies even outside of California. As Harman mentioned, as I mentioned as well, start now. Understand what it takes for your organization to meet these compliance requirements. Map it out, spend the time right now to really find the right people, the gaps, the opportunities, and even budgeting to be able to come into compliance in future years. We stressed on the importance of engaging stakeholders earlier on in the reporting process. Again, for many companies, the compliance with these regulations will be a part of the day job. Um, these efforts require engagement from various parts of the business, tons of validation of the data coming in, streamlining it, and the first couple of years are the most crucial to set you up for success for subsequent years. It's important to know how everyone knows how their work is going to feed into the ultimate compliance of these regulations as well. And when you have time, you've set it up, you know who your stakeholders are going to be, then you can establish a clear approach and foundation of this reliable data. Mapping out all of your assumptions, all of your proxies, your plans for future years, again, will make sure that you have the most robust data set that sets you up for success for the assurance process in future years as well. And ultimately setting up a great foundation for your entire climate journey. And then finally, don't be afraid to partner with experts such as South Pole to help build on your internal capacity for long-term. Again, it's a journey, it's a process. We're here to help take away some of the complexities and the administrative burden on your teams as well, and making sure that you can meet compliance requirements. And final thoughts before we wrap it up with the Q&A. You can't monitor what you don't measure. So by measuring your climate risks and your greenhouse gas footprint, you're setting yourself up to develop a plan to ultimately decarbonize your operations, your value chains, manage your risks as an organization, and really focus on business res resiliency at the end of the day. So with that, I will pass it back to Chris to help moderate the Q&A. Thank you so much, Irving and Harman. I really appreciate it. I know a lot of our clients uh, and a lot of businesses out there have a lot of questions, and I think you've covered a lot in that short amount of time. So I really appreciate that. Um, so we have a couple questions here, and if you have any, if you've thought of some as Irving and Harman have gone through things, feel free to add them. This is really meant just to bring value. So ask away. You have our time. Um, the first one. Irvi, I know you touched on this at the beginning, but could you just maybe reiterate, um, does that $1 billion in revenue apply to the revenue that a company is doing in California or in the U.S., or is it the total revenue of the business? Can you talk more about that revenue threshold? And then the follow-up question is, what does doing business in California mean? I know that was another question that you kind of talked about, but maybe you can reiterate. Sure, happy to. So for the first part of your question, the bill defines the $1 billion in USD revenue threshold for reporting entity in terms of total annual revenue and not just in the US based revenue. So even if the parent company has uh, locations elsewhere, different states or even outside of the US, we're looking at that as a consolidated $1 billion total annual revenue. For the second part of your question, what does it mean to do business in California? Again, it's still fairly undefined in the legislative text. Uh, right now, the interpretation is following the California Corporations Code and tax laws under the California Revenue and Taxation Code. So we're looking at companies that have any transactions for the purpose of financial gains within California. They have commercial residents in California, or they have sales, property, payroll, exceeding specified amounts within the tax codes in California. And again, this is subject to change and to be flushed out in future years by CARB. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have another question around reporting based on either individual entities or parent companies. How is that going to work? Would each individual company have to report uh, individually or could a parent company report on behalf of many of their holding companies? How does this all roll up? Is that clear yet? It is not. We anticipate like many other updates, uh, the California Air Resources Board CARB to clarify this in the coming year in terms of what businesses are considered covered entities that do business in California, uh, particularly applicability of subsidiaries and complex corporate structures. So a lot of that's going to be flushed out in the upcoming year. Thank you. And then recently we saw, uh, there's a question here around the recent funding announcement. Um, it seemed like some of this did not receive the anticipated funding. Can you speak to whether that was the case and what that might mean? Sure, Armin, I think this one falls a bit more under 261. Yeah, so I, I think a lot of this will echo the same sentiment. It's 2024 is a key year to track how it, the bill was passed in, in, in Q, Q4 of last year, so, you know, October. So 2024 is really the year where, you know, the, the legislature, the state, uh, the enforcement aren't going to hammer out the details. So the question around budgeting, I think there's going to be some posturing in back and forth, just tracking some of the announcements, you know, the politics of this a little bit. But I think we won't know where we land in like six months in these details or, or the end of the year. I think in the next few months, it may get pushed back a little bit. I think there's some key themes to keep in mind here um, as we try to understand the backdrop of, you know, the, the, the legislature or the political process. One is California, you know, it's, it's an individual state, whereas SEC, you know, is the U.S. Now, why that's worth the, the entire country? Why is that worth noting? That's because California has a little bit more leeway when we have a little bit less pushback to get to get this bill passed. Now, the enforcement arm, at least for uh, 253, which is which is CARB, um, they have their hands full. So in terms of budgeting, how will they meet these timelines? that's not quite clear and valid concerns have been raised which is are they going to push those timelines back so in, in some sense the car went before the horse meaning you know we've implicated a lot of organizations who are rushing to to get up on track get up to speed however it's not clear you know whether um car or the enforcement will be able to kind of track that influx so th there's also that you know will they have the right resources or the, uh, you know, the organization to implement all of this. Now, I guess w w what I would, what we advise clients who have similar questions and what I would recommend everyone on this call is to focus on those clear headline requirements, which are, you know, are the same ones across other disclosure requirements because those are gonna move forward one way or another, right? The GHG accounting, uh, the climate risk aligned with TCFD, now, in terms of enforcement or if the timelines get pushed back by six months or budgeting process, that's not something, you know, we can see too much change in. However, it's worth noting, I think there will be less, you know, variability compared to the SEC process. As you've seen, you know, those Congress meetings, SEC has been, de has been delaying this. Uh, their, their kind of proposed rules for quite some time. So I think, you know, to say plainly, we should take California with a little bit more of, you know, with a concrete plan and steps on those timelines. Whether those timelines get pushed back is for scope one and two will get pushed back and scope three, perhaps. But I think as Irvi and I have outlined, the process of getting, you know, those steps in place is a multi-year journey. So, you know, the takeaway for organizations is to start now and to take California quite seriously. Thanks, Harmon. Um, there was a follow-up question here around timelines. Do we have timelines on maybe we'll get more clarity? I think um, just to address that one quickly, I think we're not sure, um, but it's been indicated that it would be this year is kind of the, the order of magnitude that we know of. Um, there was another question as well on complex structures. Hopefully, Harmon's answer and Irvi's answer uh, covered that. Basically, we're not exactly sure how 
it's going to be enforced in terms of structure where their one parent company could report on behalf of all the entities, whether they're going to want to see an entity break out of these things. Um, that's still in flux. Uh, there was also a question about the other regulation that California passed, AB 1305. I think that one deserves possibly its whole other webinar. So if you have questions, feel out free to reach out directly and we can talk about that. Um, but we'll keep the questions focused on, on these two for today. Uh, there was another one around the consolidation of reporting. So, you know, these are two more things that sustainability teams are now being asked to report to um, Irvine and Harmon. I think this is a broader question, but maybe can you speculate at all? Do you like, where do you see this going? We're seeing more and more reporting, whether it's industry, now government, you have CDP, you have all these entities requesting reports. Do you see consolidation in the future? If you can speculate on, on any of that, that would be helpful, I think. Sure, I'm happy to start off and Harmon, feel free to uh, chime in as well. So again, another process that's not fully defined. However, the California Air Resources Board is committed to ensure that the emissions reporting is structured in a way that minimizes duplication of efforts. Um, this means different international reporting requirements, as well as any reporting requirements that come from the federal government in the U.S. At this point, um, as it's outlined in the legislative text, Compliance can be met, especially with uh, SB 261, if there's a publicly accessible report that includes the requirements um, outlined in the bill. Um, and then this is also aligned with CSRD and TS TCFD requirements as well. I mean, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add there. Yeah, no, I think you captured it well. A, well. a couple other things I'd say is, you know, uh, the disclosure landscape has started to get more and more consolidated. I think we'll see that trend continue where we've gone from you know dozens down to a handful. Um, specific, uh, especially for 261, you know, um, what's outlined in the bill is you know if you're reporting it publicly, if you're aligned with TCFD, if it's in your annex or in your annual report, that is fine as long as it's published. Um, 253, obviously, there's a bit of an enforcement and a higher fee, so. That's a little bit trickier. I think one thing to note is um, none of these bills, uh, these bills compared to other disclosure requirements, aren't pulling you in separate directions. You know, even the differences in these bills are, you know, some might go beyond the other ones. Said another way, if you're if you're preparing for, you know, say the most stringent requirements in the in California has scope three. Um, uh, you know, SEC is quite stringent on financial risk, both, uh, you know, current as well as future. If you try to understand the entire disclosure of the landscape, and this is where we took the time in the presentation to, to kind of walk that through, as well as in, highlight that as a first step, you know, we help in our process, when we engage with companies, we outline the roadmap for organizations where we lay out the steps that'll help you check off the boxes for all those reporting standards. So, you know, understanding, not ignoring some of the, you know, the, the, some of the toughest parts of your sustainability journey, such as scope three, uh, quantifying financial risks, is an important part to not, uh, part of, you know, your roadmap to not get blindsided. Because as you can tell, you know, across the disclosure landscape, they're starting to become more ambitious in terms of what they're demanding of organizations. So I'll do that. Thanks, Harmon. Um, we have another question around the complexity and challenges of scope three. So it's a, it's a bit broad of a question, but Irby, I don't know if you have any thoughts or maybe just inspiring words for those that are struggling and tackling scope three and now knowing that it's going to be required soon for government reporting. Um, how, are, how are you helping clients think about that? One, you're not alone. Most companies we work with are in a similar position. I think it's helpful to take a step back and again, map out the particular requirements. So under the greenhouse gas protocol, particularly scope three, there's 15 categories that may or may not be applicable to the organization. So starting with a matrix would be a good idea, looking at each category, seeing if it's relevant to your organization and where you might be able to find pieces of data in order to meet the requirements under the greenhouse gas protocol. From there, you can start identifying data owners, any potential gaps or overlaps that you might have. 
um, and being able to group that within business units or structures within the organization. So for example, in our experience, we've seen the finance team often carries a lot of information required for scope three reporting. And then once you've identified those data owners, then next step is to really engage those stakeholders. Do they understand why we're doing this? Um, to what extent? And being able to talk about what kind of data exists within your organization. How can you work towards more granularity? Is it worth the effort based on what the company is trying to do? Um, and how much time will it take to be able to get that data from all of the various parts of the business? So long story short, I do believe, especially CARB in this uh, context, they are aware of the challenges and complexities that come with scope three. I believe that's why they've also added a bit of a caveat that this will be evaluated in 2027, especially the leniency that they have regarding the penalties required for uh, the penalty buffer that they're giving for scope three accounting, um, knowing that many companies are going to face a bit of a challenge there. Again, I think it also empowers organizations to start having more transparent conversations with their suppliers. So when we're looking at scope three, we're looking at engaging your supply chain. How can you work with suppliers that also have their own targets or collecting their own data, which will ultimately feed and support the reporting organization's data collection efforts? I'll stop there. Lots to chat about that topic, so feel free to reach out and we can connect as well. Thanks, Harvey. Um, it looks like this is going to be the last question, but if you have any others, feel free to send them over. Um, and this question, I think, ties things together nicely. We saw in the polls a lot more companies are a lot further along in their greenhouse gas accounting than their measurement of climate risk, the financial impacts. So maybe, Harmon, as we close, for companies that are already doing their greenhouse gas accounting, what data do they already have that you would be using in risk assessment? And then what new data do they need to go get? So are they already, do they already have some of the data that they need? Um, maybe can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, sorry, just to confirm the question, um, related to financial, uh, quantifying financial risks, organization, how, how does the organization's existing GHG inventory and data play a role? Yeah, no, great question. Um, it, it's on the transition side of the equation, typically. So, you know, you know, as as kind of Ravi walked us through, GHG accounting is typically understanding your footprint, reducing your footprint, decarbonizing, and, and that's motivated, you know, by making your company more sustainable and or you know investor pressures and so on and so forth. So that's typically transition side of the, the equation. Because ultimately, it's having, helping us get to, um, you know, uh, below two degree world. It's worth noting when we talk about climate risks, it's the impact of climate on the organization. Whereas when we typically think about GHG accounting, it's how is my organization impacting the overall GHG emissions? Now, where there is overlap and quite a bit, quite a bit of consideration, you know, as altruistic as organizations may be, you know, GHG accounting and reducing your footprint is driven by, you know, practical pressures, who either that's investor, competitive, regulation, uh, sector specific. And the one we see a lot with our clients is, hey, my customer downstream is saying they may no longer do business with us if we don't decarbonize, right? So there's practical business implications. So in the transition side of the equation, we try to understand your footprint today, you know, and looking into the future, what risks does it pose to your business? So if you have a pretty significant footprint and you do not, you don't do much about it, you know, and as an example, your clients may stop doing business with you as an upstream partner to their value chain. They'll just go at a competitor or customers may increasingly want more sustainable products, um, you know, now we've seen the net zero Apple Watch, for instance, we're starting to see, you know, demand for these products. That's where the part of the equation comes in. But it's worth noting that it is the impact of climate and climate risks on your business, not the other way around, at least for 261 specifically. I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Yeah, that's great. 
Well, thank you very much, Irvi and Harmon. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to walk us through this. Um, like I said, this is intended to be the first of a full year long journey with South Pole covering all the different topics within sustainability that affect your business. So feel free to either use that QR link or look for your inbox uh, for an invite next month. We'll unpack our net zero report. And then in March, I think we will be diving into biodiversity, which is, I know, uh, a hot topic. So thank you very much for your time. If you have any follow up questions that we weren't able to cover, feel free to reach out to myself, Irvi, Harmon, or the general contact email at South Pole USA. Uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you very much.